Hello everyone, this is a good captain and welcome to another tutorial video on the Midway Guadalcanal game system produced by Avalon Hill in the early 90s. This is the Operation Coral Sea, video number four. So before we go into May 4th turn four here, uh, I have to clean up a few things from the previous turn. First off, I forgot to return the combat air patrol over Lexington to the arming box, so we'll just do that. That happens in the air return phase. And sticking with the air return phase, we forgot to flip over our Fort Moresby survivor, the scout that flew out, to the patrol side and declare that we are shadowing this contact in B1. And finally, and probably most egregiously, I totally forgot to move Task Force 16 down here, the surface unit available to the Allied player. Um, so I, I am going to, my intent was to move it two spaces up towards Port Moresby. And that was in the outside chance that that base survived that onslaught. I did not anticipate that being such a foregone conclusion, um, but that was what I was intending to do. So clean that up. Okay, on to turn four. The Allied side is side A, so they'll do everything first. First is the assembly step. And this turn, we are going to launch a raid against Shortland. And yeah, it seems a little far away, but I'm going to show you a cool little trick you can do to help extend the range of your aircraft. Um, just because it, something takes off from somewhere doesn't mean it has to land on that exact base or ship. And so that's the little hint here. I'm, I'm going to actually launch a single bombing group off of the Lexington. I could send both, but I don't want to send the weakened bombing squadron too. It's got a one hit marker. I don't want to risk losing it. Uh, we can repair that battle damage during the night, so we'll leave them on deck. Um, we're also going to send a, a fighter squadron into the high cap position to protect against any scouts that might come snooping along. So that's it for Lexington. For Yorktown, I'm going to launch both dive bombing squadrons and the fighter squadron on escort duty uh, on the way to Shortland. And that's it. That's it for the assembly step for the Allies. So now we toss it to the Japanese. And the Japanese, seeing this, now can deduce that there's likely going to be a raid against Shortland. Again, the con we've had contacts. Uh, if we're the Japanese player, we know we've seen the Yorktown before at the very beginning of the game in hex L8. We know where the Lexington was last turn in M10. Sorry, let me zoom that in a little bit. So this is probably a raid against Shortland. Um, and it might seem like there's not much we can do, but there's quite a bit we can do. Uh, so for now, uh, I won't explain this all at the moment. I'll wait till the Japanese air movement and search step. But for now, let's understand we're going to launch one fighter for the only available fighter group that's ready at Rabal into the high cap position. We're also going to do the same thing with the fighter group off the Shoho. We're going to launch it into the high cap position. Okay, like that. Um, and then we're going to launch both these scouts in the normal strike box out of Rabal. Finally, we're going to, and there's a reason I'm doing this as well, we're going to launch a single fighter group um, from the Shokaku into the high cap position here. And that is, I'll tell you just off the bat, that's to hopefully shoot down that snooper um, that's shadowing us. So we'll, again, we'll wait until the air movement search step and to deal with that. Okay, so that's it for the assembly step. Uh, we now move to the ready step. This is pretty quick and easy. Uh, for the allies, we're just moving fighter groups into the ready box here and here. Okay, and for the Japanese, we're moving our strike groups up into the ready as well. And Rabal. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so now we are ready to do the C movement step. We'll start with the US, or the Allied side here. And, um, Task Force 17 with the Yorktown will move to hex J8. This is within range of the longest range Japanese air units, nine hexes away. However, we know after that big uh, Japanese raid against Port Moresby that most of them are not going to be available this turn, so this is a safe move. It also brings us in range to uh, successfully get our fighters. It's close enough to 
get our fighters to the target and back the bombers. Fighters have a shorter range than our media uh, than our dive bombers do. They have only four hexes, so we're four hexes out. Um, and the uh, Lexington group will move to hex L9, also closing the distance on Shortland to launch its raid. Uh, and finally, uh, Task Force 16 will just move to B9. Uh, since Moresby's gone, time to close the distance on the uh, relevant allied units. Okay. Uh, and then on the Japanese side, their ship movements are pretty easy. We're just moving the strike force. Uh, we're going to move them towards Rabal, and once we're in Rabal, we're going to kind of mix and match our ships and create a special fleet that will deal specifically with the American carriers. We're essentially going to combine our heavy carriers with the light carrier and create a uh, hunter-killer group to go after the Yorktown and Lexington. So we'll move to hex C1. Now, as we do, though, we have to announce to the Allied player that that's what we're doing, because remember, the Allies are uh, shadowing us. So this automatically happens. Okay, hey, I'm moving the contact in B1 to C1. Okay, great. That's all we do for right now. That's it for the Japanese movement. Okay, now we're going to go to the air movement and search step. We'll start with the allies. It's pretty easy. Um, so we're set ready to search hex C1 and see if we can get develop a better contact. However, before we do, uh, remember the Japanese put up a combat air patrol, so before we can take a peek and attempt to spot that fleet better, we have to roll for the Japanese fighter. So the Japanese fighter rolls first, they roll a three, um, and now the allied side will roll, they roll a four. So we are not shot down. Um, this is good. It allows us to convert um, our remaining movement points into a modifier for a better search result. It, it, we do have to spend one to move from B1 to C1, but the remaining four can be used uh, to, uh, to, to, to turn into a better modifier. So those four will become a positive eight. Remember that each extra movement point is turned into a positive two. Uh, now, when you're shadowing, I'll just remind anybody, when you're shadowing, you cannot move the patrol plane from the hex that the enemy fleet moved to, but you can remove, you can use any potential remaining movement points as a search modifier, which is what we did here. So positive of eight for, our, for the, using the extra movement points, and also positive three for it being daytime. So we have a net positive 11, the allies roll a five, so we have a 16. Uh, the Japanese will now roll, they roll an eight. Uh, this is twice, uh, the allies scored a twice, a number twice as big as the Japanese, so this will um, become exact information. At the same time, we'll remove these two, these are old contacts. So this is good. Uh, we, the, the Japanese would force, be forced to give us an exact count of how many ships are there. We could deduce that that's the uh, fleet carrier group. And now it's eligible for a potential submarine attack. Okay, so we'll leave that alone for now. We come down here. Um, should have done this at the beginning, but it doesn't really matter. We'll get our air units out on the board, one over Task Force 11, and this group over Task Force 17. And then now we'll go ahead and move them towards the uh, Shortland base. So Yorktown's group will go straight in. One, oops. Okay. Two, three, four. And then Lexington's group will use an unequal movement leg. We'll go one, two, three, four, five. Even though it's printed value of five, you can actually move up to double as long as you have a legal landing point. And since we intend to land this back on the Yorktown, we can go six and then seven, eight, nine, ten. Right, so that, that's, that's how that's legal. And since we had all air units congregate in J5 before heading into the target group, we, we don't have to suffer the consequences of a wave attack. So we're all striking all together in one, um, in one large group. Now it's the Japanese side, um, and there's a neat little trick we're going to employ as the Japanese. When you put air units into a high combat air patrol, this does not qualify, for, this is not available to anybody or any air units in the low combat air patrol box, but if you're in the high cap box, it doesn't commit you to simply staying in the hex, providing combat air patrol to the hex that you were launched from. You can provide combat air patrol to any hex that has a 
a fleet counter or base counter in it up to the movement range of the aircraft. So Rabal has the Rabal fighter group has a range of seven, and the Shoho fighter group has a range of six. Um, we can actually move to the Shortland base like so. Okay, watch this. This is how this works. We just drop them into the high cap box of the Shortland base. Since both those fighter groups are within range, Shortland is only five hexes away from Rabal, the Hex F4, or I'm sorry, the Hex F1. It's only five hexes away, so this is a legal move. We move them over Shortland. So now we're gonna, we've prepared a nasty little surprise for that uh, expected allied air raid against um, Shortland. Okay? Okay. Um, that's not all. We have uh, a number of Japanese scout air units in the air. Um, that we're now going to use to try to locate uh, the Allied fleets with. Now this is an old contact, I just leave it here so that we know this is where we last saw the Lexington. We had an aborted submarine strike against it last turn. Um, we know that it could, uh, it could only be in this hex or in an adjacent hex. It can't have gone far, so we'll use the patrol plane KK here in J9 to go searching for it. And again, we're just gonna we're gonna track it down. It's this is its main job. So we're gonna go into K10. Well, well, first we'll call out the hex we're in. We'll spend one in the hex we're in for J9. I, you never know where that Yorktown might have gone to. No, it's nothing there. Okay. Then K10, nothing there. Uh, hex L9, that's nothing there. So we spent three movement points uh, so far. Actually, on the third one, is that where it is? <laughs> Sorry, I forget. Let's see. Yeah, we're in L9. So we spent. On our third, we spent three to do that, and we and we found it. Okay. So we have uh, we flip this back over to its question mark side. One, two, three. So we've spent three. So I'll just punch that in here. Before I forget. And then we ask the allied player. Okay, are there any? I'm gonna move in for a closer look or whatever. I'm, you know, do you have any combat air patrol? And the Lexington answers yes because we we launched a combat air patrol for the Lexington. And uh, they say, okay, go ahead and roll it. So the allied side rolls for their fighter. They roll a 10. Oof. So on a 1 through 3, this flying boat is going to be shot down. Ah, they rolled a 5. So they pass that, biting their fingernails. Now the Japanese player must decide how much um, movement they want to spend to enhance their search modifier. And we're exactly 11 hexes away from base, so we can spend all our time here. We only spent 3 to get here, so we'll spend the remaining eight to search this hex. So eight, yeah, nine, ten, eleven. So eight times two is sixteen. Add three for daylight. Uh, that's uh, nineteen. So we have a positive nineteen. We roll a d10. <laughs> we only rolled a one, which gives us a twenty. Uh, the allied player rolls a ten. Ooh, we only got twice as much. So. The Japanese player is provided with an exact amount of ships present in the fleet. They get exact benefits for submarine attack there. And uh, that's it. So we move to the next patrol plane. So remembering that the Yorktown task group was last seen in L8 two turns ago, uh, but we also searched that J8, J9, K8, J7 hexes, and it wasn't there. Um, Probably be prudent to start with patrol plane SS and I8 and do a, a circle loop. In other words, we'll start, we need to end where we started from in order to be eight hexes away to successfully return to Rabal in the air return phase. So we'll do I9, uh, well, first let's set, search the hex we're in. One, I8, nothing. Two, I9, nothing. Three, J9, nothing. Uh, or actually, we already searched J9. 3, J8, nothing. I forget where it is. Oh, J8, there it is. Okay, boom, we ran right into it. 3, uh, J8. So we've got a contact. So let's get up our contact. So we've spent 3. We need to be in a hex I8 or J7 to successfully return to Rabal. So we can spend 4 movement points here. Uh, that into a positive 8 modifier for searching. Add in daylight, we end up with a net positive 11. And that becomes uh, a 13 after we roll our die. 
So the American or the Allied side will now roll. They roll a six. So uh, thirteen is twice as much as six. So we get exact information and an exact number of ships. So now we can deduce that we're still missing that task force six. Uh, what was it? The other task force, the surface group, is somewhere out there still. Um, it's not. It wasn't. It's not anywhere near. It appears to to these uh, carrier task forces. Um, so let's see. That's, it's, it doesn't seem likely that the Allied player would send that task group up into the northeast part of the board at this point now, since we've identified that where it's not, what ships are where. It's probably down in the southwest corner of the board somewhere, uh, given that Port Moresby is the onus of this operation. Maybe it was trying to get over there. At least that's what I'm going with. I, mean, I know it's a little weird to play solitaire, but um, even if an Allied player had committed that surface group to some crazy end game end run around the map um, it's still the easiest thing to do to figure out that that's what he's doing is to search the this area and make sure he's not there so we're going to move towards that direction we're going to go one two three four and searching all of these hexes the whole way five six uh, seven, eight, okay, and we find nothing, right, because we know we're in hex B9, but we, we searched out a chunk of the ocean, and uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we're actually too far to return to Rabal, so this patrol plane will return to lay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, um, and we still have two fresh flying boats to send out, so we're going to do those real quick, whoops, On the search board, and we're going to go as far to the southwest corner as we can. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And we're calling these out all the whole way. Ten, eleven. There's nothing. And then finally, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and bingo. We find something. Okay. Now we, we have the full whereabouts of the Allied fleet. Uh, right, so let's place our question mark. Our third one. We got one extra movement point we can spend there. We absolutely will do that. So that'll turn into a positive two. Add three for daytime. We have a net positive five and we roll a two, which is a seven. The Allied player rolls a 10, so this remains a question mark. And that's it. That's it for the Japanese air movement and search step. We now go to combat. So we're going to now conduct the raid against Shortland Base. And uh, the Japanese will... Well, now it's not much of a surprise since the American player saw those form up over Shortland. Boom, there they are. Okay, so let's zoom in. Okay, this is a good opportunity to cover some of the more um, nuanced elements of air combats. So in that previous one, attack against Moresby, I, I didn't fully explain all the options available to the side that has more fighters. If you have more fighter groups, you have more options. The rules state that you must go one-to-one -one against any escorts versus fighters. So in this case, we're going to have the, the Shoho go one-to-one -one with this escorting group. The escort group will get to fire first, sure. But because the Japanese in this case have excess fighter groups, they have uh, additional options. They could dogpile this fighter to help ensure, it's, you know, ensure damage or even destruction against it. And if they did destroy it, they would be allowed what's called breakthrough, where they'd be able to go through and have a round of combat with the bombers. That can happen, absolutely. Um, but because we have more, we're actually automatically allowed a breakthrough with any excess fighter groups. So the Japanese player can just go straight in for a round of combat with one of these bomber groups. And that's absolutely what I'm going to decide to do as the Japanese player. I'm feeling very comfortable um, with this scenario so far. I think 
uh, we're, we're definitely on our way to a victory. At least we've got a, a much higher positive um, impact on the board strategically and point-wise. So, yeah, I want to. I'm going to take the bird in the hand here. Uh, I want to get a strike in on the bombers. I'm going to use my best fighter group to do some hopefully serious damage to one of the main fighter uh, bomber groups there. So, but first, we the escorts always fire first. So the uh, Yorktown fighter group will fire its at the Shoho fighter group protecting Shortland base here. And here we go. The, the allies will roll. They roll a seven, adding in the combat factor here of a five. We have a net of 12. So now the Japanese player will roll, and they roll a 10, which is the only number they could have rolled to avoid any damage because you add in their defense factor, and that becomes a 12 as well. So 10 plus 2 is 12. That equaled the attack factor. Now it... it turns back round. The Japanese get to strike at the American fighter group. So this, the Shoho group now rolls a d10, rolls a 6, uh, and which comes out to 12. The Americans roll a 10 as well, <laughs> and it rolled a 12, so a very dramatic and totally ineffectual fight against each other. Uh, and now they're literally, they're just out of the fight. They're done. Um, need this, the American the uh, Allied fighter will not be able to strafe, and the Shoho fighter group will not be allowed to crack at the bombers. But this rabal based zero group will now hit the bombers, and in this case, the, um, the intercepting fighters get to fire first. When you're fighting against a bomber, the fighters get to fire first. So it's, it's fought in the same exact way, just the Japanese get to go first in this case. So the Japanese roll a D10. Ooh, they rolled a 10, which turns into a 17. Wow. Uh, the Americans will roll, and they roll a one. Oh no! Um, okay, this is this is. There's a strong argument for using the free roll marker as the Americans. You can actually re-roll a round of combat with that thing, and since they have it, since this is uh, could be fairly important, uh, let me let me do some quick math. Yeah, there's actually an 18% chance of that happening. So this might be. Because it's so early in the game, we, we don't, and we're, we're so up against the wall, I feel like, as the allied player already. I think that is worth deploying the free roll marker. So we'll go back to the allied search board here, find the free roll marker, and uh, we'll drop it in here for now. It, uh, but it'll be for the Japanese. So we'll set that over to the side here. And that forces the, 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 that combat to be restarted. So the Japanese now roll again. They roll it. Oh, wow. And they rolled a 10 again for a, a net 17. Let's see if the allied side can roll better. Ah, they did. They rolled a 12. Uh, so 17 is only greater than, not twice as much as 12, obviously. So this was well worth it, more than likely. Rather than that entire unit being destroyed, scouting 5 is marked with a one-hit marker. Okay. And now it gets to fire back at the, the, the zero group that attacked it. Um, its air combat factor is a three, however it's been reduced by one to a two. This is the one hit marker. We roll a lousy two. The only way the Japanese will take a hit is if they roll a one and they don't. So that's it. That's it for all air combats. We go straight to the bombing combat. I'm sorry, the anti-aircraft combat. Shortland's anti-aircraft batteries will, of course, train their guns on that weakened bomber unit. They have an anti-aircraft factor of 3. They roll a D10, adding in 3 more for a total of 6. The defense factor has been reduced from 2 to 1. The allied player rolls a 10, brushing off that anti-aircraft. And now they start their dives. We add up all three dive bombing factors. We have a 21, uh, minus 1 for the hit. That makes it a 20. We roll a D10. Big roll here, we roll a 7 for 27. Uh, if the Japanese player rolls a 1 through 4, Shortland base will be destroyed, and they roll a 2. And so this will, uh, this is a modified 7, so 3 times as much destroys Shortland base. And after a brief think, uh, Japan will, uh, you know, not deploy its free roll marker. Shortland base is only worth a few points and doesn't have a longevity in the game here. So Shortland base will be deleted. The free roll marker goes to the Japanese side. Um, so all told, yes, the American or the Allied player destroyed Shortland base. However, they had to give up the free roll marker as well as receive one hit 
on one of their dive bomber groups. Uh, so not a bad trade, I'd say, for the Japanese. Not a bad trade for anybody, really. These damage markers can be repaired at night. Um, so yeah, you know, not a bad trade. Okay, let's get back to the search board. Uh, we'll move the allied point marker here, or the point tracker that we're using here, um, up by 4 to 15 to account for the destruction of the Shortland base. Okay. So we're not completely out of the game yet here. The Allies have 15 points. Uh, the Japanese have 20... Uh, well, they're about to have 28. Uh, because that uh, scout plane up there at the top of the board is about to be removed. So the Allies will do the air return phase first. Um, this entire air group must head towards the Yorktown. So they go one, two, three, four, and they drop into the operation or the arming box of the Yorktown. And it's important to understand that um, you know what your capacities are before you do something like this, or you can really cause problems. Um, so by special scenario rule, the Yorktown only has a seven capacity that was stated in the outset, and uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six and a half units on board. So we just, that's just barely legal move that we all did there. So great. Um, unfortunately, this patrol plane has nowhere to land. Um, so we will hand it over to the Japanese and they will move their hit point marker or the hit point tracker that we're using here up to 28. Uh, where's the label? There it is. 20. Okay. So the Japanese have 28 points. The Allies have 15 points. Uh, so the Allies managed to close it up a little bit there um, with their successful raid against the Shortland base. Okay, now we're doing the Japanese return phase. Uh, the patrol plane TT and D9 will head 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and land in Lei. A use for Lay. <laughs> so we landed him, put him in the arming box at Lay. Okay. Uh, but that's not all. We have to return this one to Rabal. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, oh, eight. Oh, we forgot to move. We saved a movement point, right? He was supposed to be in I8. That was my bad. So anyway, he moves back into F1 and lands on ball in the arming box there we go okay and finally a patrol plane kk does as well one two three four five six uh you know and just in case you're wondering one two yeah we did that one right no you cannot search on your way back it says explicitly in the rule book you can you can't search on your way back home okay these two patrol boats will flip to their patrol side uh, so we can tag that unit on a, on the next turn. So, okay. Um, now that the air return phase is complete, oh, oops, I almost forgot these two fighter squadrons need to return after doing their high cap job over Shortland. They return to their respective bases. So uh, the fighter group, one goes to Rabal and one goes to the Shoho. Okay. They could, you know, the Shoho's fighter group could land on Rabal, absolutely. This clear bubble here means that, here I'll zoom it in even more, this clear circle uh, means that this fighter can land on carriers or on land. The green ball here means that you can only land on a, on a land base. Okay, and now we get to roll for a potential sub. So both sides have a potential here. So if one side or the other rolls three times as much as the other, then th that side will get a sub. So we'll do Let's see who had side A. The allies. Well, the allied side will go first. They roll a six. So if the Japanese roll a one or two, the allied side will get a sub strike. Ah, it did not happen. No subs. Oh, well. Maybe next time. We now advance the turn markers to turn five on both search boards. And I like to, of course, roll for side A, side B before we end the video. So we'll have guy who, who was side A, allies will go first, they roll a two, and the Japanese roll a three. So the Japanese will be 
side A on the following turn, and the allied side will be side B. Thanks for watching this. All the best from the good captain, and bye-bye.